Okay, so today we are pretty far into the book. Um, and we are starting today off with chapter 58. <clears throat> Manon Blackbeak hated this forest. The trees were unnaturally close, so close that they had to leave the wyverns behind in order to make their way to the clearing a half a mile from the crumbling temple. At least the humans hadn't been stupid enough to pick the temple itself as a meeting site. It was too precariously perched, the ravine too open to spying eyes. Yesterday, Manon and the Thirteen had scouted all the clearings within a mile radius, weighing them for their visibility, accessibility, and cover, and finally settled on this one, near enough to where the king had originally demanded they meet, but far a far more protected spot. Rule one of dealing with mortals, never let them pick the exact location. First, her grandmother and her escort coven strode through the trees from wherever they'd landed, a covered wagon in tow, no doubt carrying the weapon she created. She assessed Manon with a slashing glance and merely said, Keep silent and out of the way. Speak only when spoken to. Don't cause trouble or I'll rip out your throat. Later then. She would talk to her grandmother about the bog later. The king was late. Sorry, the music got suddenly very loud. Um, and his party made enough God's damned noise as they traipsed through the woods. The Banan heard them a good five minutes before the king's massive black war horse appeared around the bend in the path. The other riders flowed behind him like a dark shadow. The scent of the bog slithered along her body. They'd, they'd brought a prison wagon with them, containing a prisoner to be transferred to Morath. Female, from the smell of her. And strange. She'd never come across that scent before. Not bog, not fey, not entirely human. Interesting. But the Thirteen were warriors, not couriers. Her hands behind her back, Manon waited as her grandmother gilded, glided toward the king, monitoring his human bog entourage while they surveyed the clearing. The man closest to the king didn't bother glancing around. His sapphire eyes went right to Manon, and stayed there. He would have been beautiful were it not for the dark collar around his throat and the utter coldness in his perfect face. He smiled at Manon as though he knew the taste of her blood. She stifled the urge to bare her teeth and shifted her focus to the matron, who had now stopped before the mortal king. Such a reek from these people. How was her grandmother not grimacing as she stood before them? Your Majesty, her grandmother said, her black robes like liquid night as she gave the slightest of bobs. Manon shut down the bark of protest in her throat. Never, never had her grandmother bowed or curtsied or so much as nodded for another ruler, not even the other matrons. Manon shoved the outrage de down deep as the, du as the king dismounted in one powerful movement. Hi, witch he said, angling his head and not a quite a bow, but enough to show some kernel of acknowledgement. A massive sword hung at his side. His clothes were dark and rich, and his face, cruelty incarnate. Not the cold, cunning cruelty that Manon had honed and delighted in, but base, brute cruelty. The kind that sent all those men to break into her cottages, thinking her in need of a lesson. This was the man to whom they were to bow. To whom her grandmother had lowered her head a fraction of an inch. Her grandmother gestured behind her with an iron-tipped hand, and Manon lifted her chin. I present to you my granddaughter, Manon, heir of the Blackbeak clan and wing leader of your aerial cavalry. Manon stepped forward, enduring the raking gaze of the king. The dark-haired young man, who had ridden at his side, dismounted with fluid grace, still smirking at her. She ignored him. You do your people a great service, wing leader, the king said, his voice like granite. Manon just stared at him, keenly aware of the matron judging her every move. Aren't you going to say anything? the king demanded, his thick brows, one scarred, 
Hi. I was told to keep my mouth shut, Manan said. Her grandmother's eyes flashed. Unless you'd prefer I get on my knees and grovel. Oh, there would certainly be hell to pay for that remark. Her grandmother turned to the king. She's an arrogant thing, but you'll find no deadlier warrior. But the king was smiling, though it didn't reach his dark eyes. I don't think you've ever groveled for anything in your life, wing leader. Manon gave him a half smile in return, her iron teeth out. Let his young companion wet himself at the sight. We witches aren't born to grovel before humans. The king chuckled mirthlessly and faced her grandmother, whose iron-tipped fingers had curved as if she were imagining them around Manon's throat. You chose our wing leader well, matron, he said, and then gestured to the wagon painted with the iron teeth banner. Let us see what you've brought for me. I hope it will be equally impressive and worth the wait. Her grandmother grinned, revealing iron teeth that had begun to rust in some spots, and ice licked up Manon's spine. This way. Shoulders back, head high, Manon waited at the bottom of the wagon steps to follow the matron and the king inside. But the man, so much taller and wider than she up close, frowned at the sight of her. My son can entertain the wing leader. And that was it. She was shut up as he and her grandmother vanished within. Apparently, she wasn't to see this weapon. At least, not as one of the first, wing leader or not. Manon took a breath and checked her temper. Half of the thirteen encircled the wagon for the matron's safety, while the others dispersed to monitor the royal party around them. Knowing their place, their inadequacy in the face of the thirteen, the escort coven faded back into the tree line. Black uniformed guards watched them all, some armed with spears, some with crossbows, some with vicious swords. The prince was now leaning against a gnarled oak. Noticing her attention, he gave her a lazy grin. It was enough. King's son or not, she didn't give a damn. Manon crossed the clearing, sorrel behind her, on edge, but keeping her distance. There was no one in earshot as Manon stopped a few feet away from the crown prince. Hello, princeling, she purred. The world kept slipping out from underneath Kaol's feet, so much so that he grabbed a handful of dirt just to remember where he was and that this was not and that this was real, not some nightmare. Dorian, his friend, unharmed, but but not Dorian. Not even close to Dorian, as the prince smirked at that beautiful white haired witch. The face was the same, but the soul gazing out of those sapphire eyes had not been created in this world. Kaol squeezed the dirt harder. He had run. He had run from Dorian and let this happen. It hadn't been hope that he carried when he fled, but stupidity. Aelin had been right. It would be a mercy to kill him. With the king and, the, with the king and matron occupied, Kaol glanced toward the wagon and then at Aelin, lying on her stomach in the brush, a dagger out. She gave him a quick nod, her mouth a tight line. Now. If they were going to make their move to free Lysandra, it would have to be now. And for Nehemia, for the friend banished beneath a wordstone collar, he would not falter. The ancient cruel demon squatting inside him began to thrash as the white-haired witch sauntered up to him. It had been content to sneer from afar. One of us, one of ours, it hissed to him. We made it, so we'll take it. Every step closer made her unbound hair shimmer like moonlight on water. But the demon began scrambling away as the sun lit up her eyes. Not too close, it said. Do not let the witchling too close. The eyes of the bald kings. Hello, princeling, she said, her voice bedroom soft and full of glorious death. Hello, witchling, he said. And the words were his own. For a moment, he was so stunned that he blinked. He blinked. The demon inside him recoiled, clawing at the walls of his mind. Eyes of the Vol Kings, eyes of our masters, it shrieked. Do not touch that one. Is there a reason you're smiling at me? She said, or shall I interpret it as a death wish? 
Do not speak to it. He didn't care. Let this be another dream, another nightmare. Let this new, lovely monster devour him whole. He had nothing beyond the here and now. Do I need a reason to smile at a beautiful woman? I'm not a woman. Her iron nails glinted as she crossed her arms. And you? She sniffed. Man or demon? Prince, he said. That's what the thing inside him was. He had never learned its name. Do not speak to it! He cocked his head. I've never been with a witch. Let her rip out his throat for that. End it. A row of iron fangs snapped down over her teeth as her smile grew. I've been with plenty of men. You're all the same. Tastes the same. She looked him over as if he were her next meal. I dare you, he managed to say. Her eyes narrowed, the gold like living embers. He'd never seen anyone so beautiful. This witch had been crafted from the darkness between the stars. I think not, Prince, she said in her midnight voice. She sniffed again, her nose crinkling slightly. But would you bleed red or black? I'll bleed whatever color you tell me to. Step away! Get away! The demon prince inside him yanked so hard he took a step. But not away. Toward the white-haired witch. She let out a low, vicious laugh. What is your name, prince? His name. He didn't know what that was. She reached out, her iron nails glimmering in the dappled sunlight. The demon screaming was so loud in his head that he wondered if his ears would bleed. Iron clinked against the stone as she grazed the collar around his neck. Higher. If she just slashed higher. Like a dog, she murmured. Leashed to your master. She ran a finger along the curve of the collar, and he shuddered. In fear. In pleasure. In anticipation of the nails tearing into his throat. What is your name? A command, not a question, as eyes of pure gold met his. Dorian, he breathed. Your name is nothing. Your name is mine, the demon hissed, and a wave of that human woman screaming swept him away. Crouched in the brush just twenty feet from the prison wagon, Aelin froze. Dorian? It couldn't have been. There wasn't a chance of it, not when the voice that Dorian had spoken with was so empty, so hollow, but... Beside her, Kale's eyes were wide. Had he heard the slight shift? The wing leader cocked her head, her iron-tipped hand still touching the wordstone collar. Do you want me to kill you, Dorian? Aelin's blood went cold. Kale tensed, his hand going toward, going to his sword. Aelin gripped the back of his tunic in silent reminder. She had no doubt that across the clearing, Nesrin's arrow was already pointed with lethal accuracy at the wing leader's throat. I want you to do lots of things to me, the prince said, raking his eyes along the witch's body. The humanity was gone again. She'd imagined it. The way the king had acted. That was a man who held pure control over his son, confident that there was no struggle inside him. A soft, joyless laugh, and then the wing leader released Dorian's collar. Her red cloak flowed around her on a phantom wind as she stepped back. Come find me again, prince, and we'll see about that. A vogue prince inhabited Dorian, but Aelin's nose did not bleed in its presence, and there was no creeping fog of darkness. Had the king muted its power so his son could deceive the world around him? Or was that battle still being waged inside the prince's mind? Now. They had to move now, while the matron and the king remained in that painted wagon. Rowan cupped his hands to his mouth and signaled, with a bird's call so lifelike that none of the guards shifted. But across the clearing, Adian and Nesrin heard and understood. She didn't know how they managed to accomplish it, but a minute later, the wyverns of the High Witch's Coven were roaring with alarm, the trees shuddering with the sound. Every guard and sentinel turned toward the racket, away from the prison wagon. It was all the distraction Aelin needed. She'd spent two weeks in one of those wagons. She knew the bars of the little window, 
knew the hinges and the locks, and Rowan, fortunately, knew exactly how to dispatch the three guards stationed at the back door without making a sound. She didn't dare breathe too loudly as she climbed the few steps to the back of the wagon, pulled out her lock-picking kit, and set to work. One look over here, one shift of the wind. There, the lock sprang open, and she eased the back she eased back the door, bracing for squeaky hinges. By some god's mercy, it made no sound, and the wyverns went on bellowing. Lysandra was curled against the far corner, bloody and dirty, her short nightgown torn and her bare legs bruised. No collar, no ring on either hand. Aelin bit back her cry of relief and flicked her fingers to tell the courier, to tell the courtesan, to hurry. On near silent feet, Lysandra hurtled past her, right into the speckled brown and green cloak Rowan was holding out. Two heartbeats later, she was down the steps and into the brush. Another beat, and the dead guards were inside the wagon with the door locked. Aelin and Rowan slipped back into the forest amid the roars of the wyverns. Lysandra was shivering where she knelt in the thicket, Kaol before her, inspecting her wounds. He mouthed to Aelin that she was fine, and helped the courtesan rise to her feet before hauling her deeper into the woods. It had taken less than two minutes, and thank the gods, because a moment later the painted wagon's door was flung open, and the matron and king stormed out to see what the noise was about. A few paces from Aelin, Rowan monitored every step, every breath their enemy took. There was a flash of movement beside her, and then Adian and Neswin were there, dirty and panting, but alive. The grin on Adian's face faltered as he peered back at the clearing behind them. The king stalked to the heart of the clearing, demanding answers. Butchering bastard. And for a moment, they were again in Terrasin, at that dinner table in her family's castle, where the king had eaten her family's food, drunk their finest wine, and then he tried to shatter her mind. Aideen's eyes met hers, his body trembling with restraint, waiting for her order. She knew she might live to regret it, but Aelin shook her head. Not here, not now. There were too many variables and too many players on the board. They had Lysandra. It was time to go. The king told his son to get onto his horse and barked orders to the others as the wing leader backed away from the prince with a casual, lethal grace. The matron waded across the clearing, her voluminous black robes billowing despite her stillness. Aelin prayed that she and her companions would never run into the matron, at least not without an army behind them. Whatever the king had seen inside the painted wagon had been important enough that they hadn't risked letters about its specific details. Dorian mounted his horse, his face cold and empty. I'll come back for you, she promised him. She had not thought it would be in this way. The king's party departed with eerie silence and efficiency, seemingly unaware that they were now missing three of their own. The stench of the fog faded as they vanished, cleared away by a brisk wind as if Oakwald itself wanted to wipe away any trace. Headed in the opposite direction, the witches prowled into the trees, lugging the wagon behind them with inhuman strength, until only the wing leader and her horrifying grandmother remained in the clearing. The blow happened so fast that Aelin couldn't detect it. Even Adian flinched. The smack reverberated through the forest, and the wing leader's face snapped to the side to reveal four lines of blue blood now running down her cheek. Insolent fool, the matron hissed, lingering near the trees. The beautiful, golden-haired lieutenant observed every movement the matron made, so intensely that Aelin wondered if she would go for the the matron's throat. Do you wish to cost me everything? Grandmother, I sent you letters. I received your whining, sniveling letters, and I burned them. You were under orders to obey. Did you think my silence was not intentional? Do as the Duke says. How can you allow these? Another strike. Four more lines bleeding down the witch's face. You dare question me? Do you think yourself as good as a high witch now that you're wing leader? No, matron. There was no sign of that cocky, taunting tone of minutes before. Only cool, lethal rage. A killer by birth and training. But the golden eyes turned toward the painted wagon. 
a silent question. The matron leaned in, her rusted iron teeth within shredding distance of her granddaughter's throat. Ask it, Manon. Ask what's inside that wagon. The golden-haired witch by the trees was ramrod straight, but the wing leader, Manon, bowed her head. You will tell me when it's necessary. Go look. Let's see if it meets my granddaughter's standards. With that, the matron strode into the trees, the second coven of witches now waiting for her. Manon Blackbeak didn't wipe away the blue blood sliding down her face as she walked up the steps of the wagon, pausing on the landing for only a heartbeat before entering the gloom beyond. It was as good a sign as any to get the hell out. With Adian and Nesrin guarding their backs, Aelin and Rowan hurried for the spot where Kale and Lysandra would be waiting. Not without magic would she take on the king and Dorian. She didn't have a death wish, either for herself or her friends. She found Lysandra standing with a hand braced against a tree, wide-eyed, breathing hard. Kaol was gone. And that was chapter 58. On to chapter 59. The demon seized control the moment the man who wielded the collar returned. It shoved him back into that pit of memory until he was the one screaming again, until he was small and broken and fragmented. But those golden eyes lingered. Come find me again, prince. A promise. A promise of death. Of release. Come find me again. The words soon faded, swallowed up by screaming and blood and the demon's cold fingers running over his mind. But the eyes lingered, and that name, Manon. Manon. Kao couldn't let the king take Dorian back to the castle. He might never get this chance again. He had to do it now, had to kill him. Kao hurtled through the brush as quietly as he could, sword out bracing himself. A dagger through the eye, a dagger, and then, talking from ahead, along with the rustling of leaves and wood, Kaol neared the party, beginning to pray, beginning to beg for forgiveness, for what he was about to do, and for how he had run. He'd kill the king later, let that kill be his last. But this would be the kill that broke him. He drew his dagger, cocking his arm. Dorian had been directly behind the king, one throw to knock the prince off the horse, then a sweep of his sword, and it could be over. Aelin and the others could deal with the aftermath. He'd already be dead. Kaol broke through the trees into a field, the dagger a burning weight in his hand. It was not the king's party that stood there in the tall grass and sunlight. Thirteen witches and their wyverns turned to him and smiled. Aelin ran through the trees as Rowan tracked Kaol by scent alone. If he got them killed, if he got them hurt, they'd left Nesrin to guard Lysandra, ordering them to head for the forest across the nearby temple ravine and to wait under an outcropping of stones. Before hurting Lysandra between the trees, Nesrin had tightly grabbed Aelin's arm and said, Bring him back. Aelin had only nodded before bolting. Rowan was a streak of lightning through the trees, so much faster than her when she was stuck in this body. Adian sprinted close behind him. She ran as quickly as she could, but... The path veered away, and Kale had taken the wrong fork. Where the hell had Kale even been going? She could scarcely draw a breath fast enough. Then light flooded in through a break in the trees, the other side of the wide meadow. Rowan and Adian stood a few feet into the swaying grass, their swords out, but downcast. She saw why a heart beat later. Not thirty feet from them, Kaol's lip bled down his chin as the white-haired witch held him against her, iron nails digging into his throat. 
The prison wagon was open beyond them to reveal the three dead soldiers inside. The twelve witches behind the wing leader were all grinning with anticipatory delight as they took in Rowan and Adian, then her. What's this? The wing leader said, a killing light in her golden eyes. Spies? Rescuers? Where did you take our prisoner? Kaol struggled, and she dug her nails in farther. He stiffened. A trickle of blood leaked down his neck and onto his tunic. Oh gods, think. Think, think, think. The wing leader shifted those burnt gold eyes to Rowan. Your kind, the wing leader mused. I have not seen for a time. Let the man go, Rowan said. Manan's smile revealed a row of flesh-shredding iron teeth, far, far too close to Kaol's neck. I don't take orders from fey bastards. Let him go, Rowan said too softly, or it will be the last mistake you make, wing leader. In the field behind them, the wyverns were stirring, their tails lashing, wings shifting. The white-haired witch peered at Kaol, whose breathing had turned ragged. The king is not too far down the road. Perhaps I should hand you over to him. The cuts on her cheeks, scabbed in blue, were like brutal war paint. He'd be furious to learn you stole his prisoner from me. Maybe you'll appease him, boy. Aelin and Rowan shared all of one look before she stepped up to his side, drawing Goldrin. If you want a prize to give the king, Aelin said, then take me. Don't, Kaol rasped out. The witch and all twelve of her sentinels now fixed their immortal, deadly attention on Aelin. Aelin dropped Goldrin to the into the grass and lifted her hands. Adian snarled in warning. Why should I bother, the wing leader said. Perhaps we'll take you all to the king. Adian's sword lifted slightly. slightly. You can try. Aelin carefully approached the witch, her hands still up. You enter into a fight with us, and you and your companions will die. The wing leader looked her up and down. Who are you? An order. Not a question. Aelin Galathinius. Surprise. And perhaps something else. Something Aelin couldn't identify sparked in the wing leader's golden eyes. The Queen of Terrasin. Aelin bowed not daring to take her attention off the witch. At your service. Only three feet separated her from the black beak air. The witch sliced a glance to ka at Kaol, and then at Adian and Rowan. Your court? What's it to you? The wing leader studied Adian again. Your brother? My cousin, Adian. Almost as pretty as me, wouldn't you say? The witch didn't smile. But Aelin was now near enough, so close that the spatters of Kaol's blood lay in the grass before the tip of her boots. The Queen of Terrasin. Elite's hope had not been misplaced, even if the young queen was now towing the dirt and grass, unable to keep still while she bargained for the man's life. Behind her, the Fey warrior observed every flicker of movement. He'd be the deadly one, the one to look out for. It had been fifty years since she'd fought a fey warrior, bedded him, then fought him. He'd left the bones of her arm in pieces. She'd just left him in pieces. But he had been young and arrogant and barely trained. This male. He might very well be capable of killing at least a few of her thirteen if she so much as harmed a hair on the queen's head. And then there was the golden-haired one, as large as the fey male, but per possessing his cousin's bright arrogance and honed wildness. He might be problematic if left alive too long. The queen kept fidgeting her foot in the grass. She couldn't be more than 20, and yet she moved like a warrior too. Or she had, until the incessant shifting around. But she halted the movement, as if realizing that it gave away her nerves, her inexperience. The wind was blowing in the wrong direction for Manon to detect the queen's true level of fear. Well, wing leader, would the king put a collar around her fair neck as he had the princess, or would he kill her? It made no difference. She would be a prize the king would welcome. Manon shoved away the captain, sending him stumbling toward the queen. 
Aelin reached out with an arm, nudging him to the side. Behind her, Manon and the queen stared at each other. No fear in her eyes, in her pretty, mortal face. None. It'd be more trouble than it was worth. Manon had bigger things to consider anyway. Her grandmother approved. Approved of the breeding, the breaking of the witches. Manon needed to get into the sky, needed to lose herself in cloud and wind for a few hours. Days. Weeks. I have no interest in prisoners or battling today, Manon said. The Queen of Terrison gave her a grin. Good. <clears throat> Manon turned away, barking at her thirteen to get to their mounts. I suppose, the Queen went on, that makes you smarter than Baba Yellowlegs. Manon stopped, staring straight ahead and seeing nothing of the grass, or sky, or trees. Astrin whirled. What do you know of Baba Yellowlegs? The queen gave a low chuckle, despite the warning growl from the fey warrior. Slowly, Manon looked over her shoulder. The queen tugged apart the lapels of her tunic, revealing a necklace of thin scars as the wind shifted. The scent, iron and stone and pure hatred, hit Manon like a rock to the face. Every Iron Teeth witch knew the scent that forever lingered on those scars. Witch killer. Perhaps Manon would lose herself in blood and gore instead. You're carrion, Manon said, and lunged, only to slam face first into an invisible wall, and then freeze entirely. Run, Aelin breathed, snatching up Goldrin and bolting for the trees. The wingleader was frozen in place, her sentinels wide-eyed as they weren't rushed to her. Kale's human blood wouldn't hold the spell for long. The ravine, Adian said, not looking back from where he sprinted ahead with Kale toward the temple. They hurtled through the trees, the witches still in the meadow, still trying to break the spell that had trapped their wingleader. You, Rowan said as he ran beside her, are one very lucky woman. Tell me that again when we're, when we're out of here. She panted, leaping over a fallen tree. A roar of fury set the birds scattering from the trees, and Aelin ran faster. Oh, the wingleader was pissed. Really, really pissed. Aelin hadn't believed for one moment that the witch would have let them walk away without a fight. She had needed to buy whatever time they could get. The trees cleared, revealing a barren stretch of land jutting toward the deep ravine, and the temple perched on the spit of rock in the center. On the other side, Oakwald sprawled onward. Connected only by two chain and wood bridges. It was the sole way across the ravine for miles, and with the dense foliage of Oakwald blocking the wyverns, it was the only way to escape the witches, who would no doubt pursue on foot. Hurry, Rowan shouted, as they made for the crumbling temple ruins. The temple was small enough that not even the priestess had dwelled here not even the priestesses had dwelled here. The only decorations on the stone island were five weather-stained pillars and a crumbling domed roof. Not even an altar, or at least one that had survived the centuries. Apparently, people had given up on Temis long before the King of Adderlin came along. She just prayed that the bridges on either side. Adian hurled himself to a stop before the first footbridge. Kael thirty paces behind, Aelin and Rowan following. Secure! Adian said. Before she could bark a warning, he thundered across. The bridge bounced and swayed, but held. Held as even her damn heart stopped. Then Adian was at the temple island, the single thin pillar of rock carved out by the rushing river flowing far, far below. He waved Kale on. One at a time, he ordered. Beyond him, the second bridge waited. Kale hurried through the stone pillars that flanked the entrance to the first bridge. The thin iron chains on the sides writhing as the bridge bounced. He kept upright, flying toward the temple, faster than she'd ever seen him run during all those morning exercises through the castle grounds. Then Aelin and Rowan were at the columns, and Don't even try to argue, Rowan hissed, shoving her ahead of him. Gods above, that was a wicked drop beneath them. The roar of the river was barely a whisper. But she ran. Ran because Rowan was waiting, and there were the witches breaking through the trees with fey swiftness. The bridge bucked and swayed as she shot over the aging wooden planks. Ahead, Adian had cleared the second bridge to the other side, 
and Kale was now sprinting across it. Faster. She had to go faster. She leaped the final few feet onto the temple rock. Ahead, Kale exited the second bridge and drew his blade as he joined Adian on the grassy cliff beyond. An arrow knocked in her cousin's bow, aimed at the trees behind her. Aelin lunged up the few stairs onto the bald temple platform. The entire circular space was barely more than thirty feet across, bordered on all sides by a sheer plunge and death. Temis, apparently, was not the forgiving sort. She twisted to look behind. Rowan was running across the bridge, so fast that the bridge hardly moved, but... Aelin swore. The wing leader had reached the posts, flinging herself over and jumping through the air to land a third of the way down the bridge. Even Adian's warning shot went long, the arrow embedding where the mortal, where any mortal should have landed. But not a witch. Holy burning hell. Go! Rowan roared at Aelin, but she palmed her fighting knives, bending her knees as... As an arrow fired by the golden-haired lieutenant shot for Aelin from the other side of the ravine. Aelin twisted to avoid it, only to find a second arrow from the witch already there, anticipating her maneuver. A wall of muscle slammed into her, shielding her, and shoving her to the stones. And the witch's arrow went clean through Rowan's shoulder. And that was chapter 59. <clears throat> Chapter 60 For a moment, the world stopped. Rowan slammed onto the temple stones, his blood spraying on the aging rock. Aelin's scream echoed down the ravine. But then he was up again, running and bellowing at her to go. Beneath a dark arrow protruding through his shoulder, blood already soaked his tunic, his skin. If he had been one inch farther behind, it would have hit his heart. Not forty paces down the bridge, the wingleader closed in on them. Adian rained arrows on her sentinels with preternatural precision, keeping them at bay by the tree line. Aelin wrapped an arm around Rowan as, and they raced across the temple stones, his face paling as the wound gushed blood. She might have still been screaming or sobbing. There was such a roaring silence in her. Her heart. It had been meant for her heart. And he had taken that arrow for her. The killing palm spread through her like hoarfrost. She'd kill them. All. Slowly. They reached the second bridge just as Adian's barrage of arrows halted. His quiver no doubt emptied. She shoved Rowan onto the planks. Run, she said. No. Run. It was a voice that she'd never heard herself use. A queen's voice that came out along with the blind yank she made on the blood oath that bound them together. His eyes flashed with fury, but his body moved as though she'd compelled him. He staggered across the bridge just as Aelin whirled, drawing Goldrin and ducking just as the wingleader's sword swiped for her head. It hit stone, the pillar groaning, but Aelin was already moving, not toward the second bridge, but back toward the first one, on the witch's side. Where the other witches, without Adian's arrows to block them, were now racing from the cover of the woods. You, the wingleader growled, attacking again. Aelin rolled, right through Rowan's blood, again dodging the fatal blow. She uncurled to her feet right in front of the first bridge, and two swings of Goldrin had the chain snapping. The witches skidded to a stop at the lip of the ravine as the bridge collapsed, cutting them off. The air behind her shifted, and Aelin moved but not fast enough. Cloth and flesh tore in her upper arm, and she barked out a cry as the witch's blade sliced her. She whirled, bringing Goldrin up for the second blow. Steel met steel and sparked. Rowan's blood was at her feet, smeared across the temple stones. Aelin Galathinius looked at Manon Blackbeak over their crossed swords and let out a low, vicious snarl. Queen, savior, enemy, Manon didn't give a shit. She was going to kill the woman. Their laws demanded it. Honor demanded it. 
Even if she hadn't slaughtered Baba Yellowlegs, Manan would have killed her just for that spell she'd used to freeze her in place. That was what she'd been doing with her feet, etching some foul spell with the man's blood. And now she was going to die. Wind Cleaver pressed against the queen's blade, but Aelin held her ground and hissed, I'm going to rip you to shreds. Behind them, the thirteen gathered on the ravine's edge, cut off. One whistle from Manan had half of them scrambling for the wyverns. She didn't get to sound the second whistle. Faster than a human had a right to be, the queen swept out a leg, sending Manan tripping back. Aelin didn't hesitate. She flipped the sword in her hand and lunged. Manan deflected the blow, but Aelin got past her guard and pinned her, slamming her head against stones that were damp with the fey warrior's blood. Splotches of dark bloomed in her vision. In her vision. Manon drew in breath for the second whistle, the one to call off Astrin and her arrows. She was interrupted by the queen slamming her fist into Manon's face. Black splintered further across her vision, but she twisted, twisted with every bit of her immortal strength, and they went flipping across the temple floor. The drop loomed, and then an arrow whizzed right through the queen's exposed back as she landed atop Manon. Manon twisted again, and the arrow bounced off the pillar instead. She threw Aelin from her, but the queen was instantly on her feet again, nimble as a cat. She's mine, Manon barked across the ravine to Astarin. The queens laughed, hoarse and cold, circling as Manon got to her feet. Across the other side of the ravine, the two males were helping the wounded fey warrior off the bridge, and the golden-haired warrior charged. Don't you dare, Adian, Aelin said, throwing out a hand in the male's direction. He froze halfway across the bridge. Impressive, Manon admitted, to have them under her command so thoroughly. Hey all, keep an eye on him, the queen barked. Then, holding Manon's gaze, Aelin sheathed her mighty blade across her back, the giant ruby in the pommel catching in the midday light. Swords are boring, the queen said, and pulled two fighting knives. Manon sheathed Wind Cleaver along her own back. She flicked her wrists, the iron nails shooting out. She cracked her jaw, and her fangs descended. Indeed. The queen looked at the nails, the teeth, and grinned. Honestly, it was a shame that Manon had to kill her. Manon Blackbeak lunged, as swift and deadly as an adder. Aelin darted back, dodging each swipe of those lethal iron nails. For her throat, for her face, for her guts. Back and back, circling around the pillars. It was only a matter of minutes before the wyverns arrived. Aelin jabbed with her daggers and the witch sidestepped her, only to slash with her nails right at Aelin's neck. Aelin spun aside, but the nails grazed her skin. Blood warmed her neck and shoulders. The witch was so damn fast, and one hell of a fighter. But Rowan and the others were across the second bridge. No, she just had- now she just had to get there too. Manon Blackbeak fainted left and slashed right. Aelin ducked and rolled aside. The pillar shuddered as those iron claws gouged four lines deep into their stone. Manon hissed. Aelin made to drive her dagger into her spine. The witch lashed out with a hand and wrapped it clean around the blade. Blue blood welled, but the witch bore down on the blade until it snapped into three pieces in her hand. Gods above. Aelin had the sense to go, low, go in low with her other dagger, but the witch was already there. An Adian's shout rang in her ears as Manon's knee drove up into her gut. The air knocked from her in a whoosh, but Aelin kept her grip on the dagger, even as the witch threw her into another pillar. The stone column rocked against the blow, and Aelin's head cracked, agony arcing through her. But a slash directly for her face. Aelin ducked. Again, the stone shuddered beneath the impact. Aelin squeezed air into her body. Move. She had to keep moving. Smooth as a stream, smooth as the wind of her Karanam, bleeding and hurt across the way. Pillar to pillar, she retreated, rolling and ducking and dodging. Manon swiped and slashed, slamming into every column, a force of nature in her own right. And then back around, again and again, pillar after pillar, absorbing the blows that should have shredded her face, her neck. Aelin slowed her steps. Let Manon think she was tiring, growing clumsy. Enough, coward, Manon hissed, making to tackle Aelin to the ground. 
but Aelin swung around a pillar and onto the thin lip of bare rock beyond the temple platform, the drop looming just as Manon collided with the column. The pillar groaned, swayed, and toppled to the side, hitting the pillar beside it, sending them both cracking to the ground, along with the domed roof. Manon didn't even have time to lunge out of the way as the marble crashed down on her. One of the few remaining witches on the other side of the ravine screamed. Aelin was already running, even as the rock island itself began trembling, as if whatever ancient force held this temple together had died the moment the roof crumbled. Shit. Aelin sprinted for the second bridge, dust and debris burning her eyes and lungs. The island jolted with a thunderous crack, so violent that Aelin stumbled. But there were the posts and the bridge beyond. Adian waiting on the other side, an arm held out, beckoning. The island swayed again, wider and longer this time. It was going to collapse beneath them. There was a flicker of blue and white, a flash of red cloak, a glimmer of iron, a hand and a shoulder grappling with a fallen column. Slowly, painfully, Manon heaved herself onto a slab of marble, her face coated in pale dust, blue blood leaking down her temple. Across the ravine, cut off entirely, the golden-haired witch was on her knees. Manon! I don't think you've ever groveled for anything in your life, wing leader, the king had said. But there was a black beak witch on her knees, begging whatever gods they worshipped. That, And there was Manon Blackbeak, struggling to rise as the temple island crumbled away. Aelin took a step onto the bridge. Asterin. That was the golden-haired witch's name. She screamed for Manon again, a plea to rise, to survive. The island jolted. The remaining bridge, the bridge to her friends, to Rowan, to safety, still held. Aelin had felt it before, a thread in the world, a current running between her and someone else. She felt it one night, years ago, and had given a young healer the money to get the hell out of this continent. She'd felt the tug and had decided to tug back. Here it was again, that tug, toward Manon, whose arms buckled as she collapsed to the stone. Her enemy, her new enemy, who would have killed her and Rowan if given the chance, a monster incarnate. But perhaps the monsters needed to look out for each other every now and then. Run! Adian roared from across the ravine. So she did. Aelin ran for Manon, leaping over the fallen stones, her ankle wrenching on loose debris. The island rocked with her every step, and the sunlight was scalding, as if Mala were holding that island aloft with every last bit of strength the goddess could summon in this land. Then Aelin was upon Manon Blackbeak, and the witch lifted hate-filled eyes to her. Aelin hauled off stone after stone from her body, the island beneath them buckling. You're too good a fighter to kill. Aelin breathed, hooking an arm under Manon's shoulders and hauling her up. The rock swayed to the left, but held. Oh gods. If I die because of you, I'll beat the shit out of you in hell. She could have sworn the witch let out a broken laugh as she got to her feet, nearly a dead weight in Aelin's arms. You should let me die, Manon rasped as they limped over the rubble. I know, I know, Aelin panted her sliced arm aching with the weight of the witch it supported. They hurried over the second bridge, the temple rock swaying to the right, stretching the bridge behind them tightly over the drop in the shining river far, far below. Aelin tugged at the witch, gritting her teeth, and Manon stumbled into a staggering run. Aelin remained between the posts across the ravine, an arm still extended toward her, while his other lifted his sword high, ready for the wingleader's arrival. The rock behind them groaned. Halfway, nothing but a death plunge waiting for them. Manon coughed blue blood onto the wooden slats. Aelin snapped. What the hell good are your beasts if they can't save you from this kind of thing? The island veered back in the other direction, and the bridge went taut. Oh shit. Shit. It was going to snap. Faster they ran, until she could see Aelin's straining fingers and the whites of his eyes. The rock cracked so loudly it deafened her. Then came the tug and stretch of the bridge as the island began to crumble into dust, sliding to the side. Aelin lunged the last few steps, gripping Manon's red cloak as the chains of the bridge snapped. The wooden slaps dropped out from beneath them, 
but they were already leaping. Aelin let out a grunt as she slammed into Adian. She whirled to see Kaol grabbing Manon and hauling her over the lip of the ravine, her cloak torn and covered in dust, fluttering in the wind. When Aelin looked past the witch, the temple was gone. Manon gasped for air, concentrating on her breathing, on the cloudless sky above her. The humans left her lying between the stone bridge posts. The queen hadn't even bothered to say goodbye. She just dashed for the injured fey warrior, his name like a prayer on her lips. Rowan. Manon had looked up in time to see the queen fall to her knees before the injured warrior in the grass, demanding answers from the brown-haired man, Kaol, who pressed a hand to the arrow wound in Rowan's shoulder to staunch the bleeding. The queen's shoulders were shaking. Fire heart, the fey warrior mumbled, murmured. Manon would have watched, would have, had she not coughed blood onto the bright grass and blacked out. When she awoke, they were gone. Only minutes had passed because they were, because then there were booming wings and Abraxas's roar, and there were Astrin and Sorrel rushing for her before their wyverns had fully landed. The Queen of Terrison had saved her life. Manon didn't know what to make of it, for she now owed her enemy a life debt, and she had just learned how thoroughly her grandmother and the King of Otterland attended to destroy them. And that was chapter 60. Chapter 61 The trek back through Oakwald was the longest journey of Aelin's miserable life. Nesrin had removed the arrow from Rowan's shoulder, and Aiden had found some herbs to chew and shove into the open wound to staunch the bleeding. But Rowan still sta sagged against Kael and Aiden as they hurried through the forest. Nowhere to go. She had nowhere to take an injured fey male in the capital city, in this entire shithole kingdom. Lysandra was pale and shaking, but she'd squared her shoulders and offered to help carry Rowan when one of them tired. None of them accepted. When Kale at last asked Nesrin to take over, Aelin glimpsed the blood soaking his tunic and hands, Rowan's blood, and nearly vomited. Slower. Every step was slower as Rowan's strength flagged. He needs to rest, Lysandra said gently. Aelin paused, the towering oaks pressing in around her. Rowan's eyes were half-closed, his face drained of all color. He couldn't even lift his head. She should have let the witch die. We can't just camp out in the middle of the woods, Aelin said. He needs a healer. I know where we can take him, Kaol said. She dragged her eyes to the captain. She should have let the witch kill him, too. Kaol wisely averted his gaze and faced Nesrin. Your father's country house. The man who runs it is married to a midwife. Nesrin's mouth tightened. She's not a healer, but yes, she might have something. Do you understand, Aelin said very quietly to them, that if I suspect they're going to betray us, they will die? It was true, and maybe it made her a monster to Kaol, but she didn't care. I know, Kaol said. Nesrin merely nodded, still calm, still solid. Then lead the way, Aelin said her voice hollow, and pray they can keep their mouths shut. <sighs> Joyous, frenzied barking greeted them, rousing Rowan from the half-consciousness he'd fallen into during the last few miles of the little stone to the little stone farmhouse. Aelin had barely breathed the entire time. But despite herself, despite Rowan's injuries, as Fleetfoot raced across the high grass toward them, Aelin smiled a little. The dog leapt upon her, licking and whining and wagging her feathery golden tail. She hadn't realized how filthy and bloody her hands were until she put them on Fleetfoot's shining coat. Adian grunted as he took all of Rowan's weight while Kaol and Nesrin jogged for the large, brightly lit stone house, dusk having fallen fully around them. Good. 
fewer eyes to see as they exited Oakwald and crossed the freshly tilled fields. Fields. Lysander tried to help Adian, but he refused her again. She hissed at him and helped anyway. Fleetfoot danced around Aelin, then noticed Adian, Lysandra, and Rowan, and that tail became a bit more tentative. Friends, she told her dog. She'd become huge since Aelin had last seen her. She wasn't sure why it surprised her, when everything else in her life had changed as well. Aelin's assurance seemed good enough for Fleetfoot, who trotted ahead, escorting them to the wooden door that had opened to reveal a tall midwife with a no-nonsense face that took one look at Rowan and tightened. One word. One damn word that suggested she might turn them in. And she was dead. But the woman said, Whoever put that blood moss on the wound saved his life. Get him inside. We need to clean it before anything else can be done. It took a few hours for Marta, the housekeeper's wife, to clean, disinfect, and patch up Rowan's wounds. Lucky, she kept saying. So lucky it didn't hit anything vital. Kale didn't know what to do with himself other than carry away the blow, the bowls of bloodied water. Aelin just sat on a stool beside the cot in the spare room of the elegant, comfortable house and monitored every move Marta made. Kale wondered if Aelin knew that she was a bloodied mess, that she looked even worse than Rowan. Her neck was brutalized, blood had dried on her face, her cheek was bruised, and the left sleeve of her tunic was torn open to reveal a vicious slice. And then there were the dust, dirt, and blue blood of the wing leader coating her. But Aelin perched on the stool, never moving, only drinking water, snarling if Marta so much as looked at Rowan funny. Marta, somehow, endured it. And when the midwife was done, she faced the queen. With no clue at all who sat in her house, Marta said, You have two choices. You can either go wash up in the spigot outside, or you can sit with the pigs all night. You are dirty enough that one touch could infect his wounds. Aelin glanced over his shoulder at Adian, who was leaning against the wall behind her. He nodded silently. He'd look after him. Aelin rose and stalked out. I'll inspect your other friend now, Marta said, and hurried to where Lysandra had fallen asleep in the adjoining room, curled up on a narrow bed cot. Upstairs, Nesman was busy dealing with the staff, ensuring their silence. But he'd seen the tentative joy in their faces when they'd arrived. Nesrin and the Felic family had earned their loyalty long ago. The stars were bright overhead, the full moon nearly blinding. The night wind whispered through the grass, barely audible over the clunk and sputter of the spigot. He found the queen crouched before it, her face in the stream of water. I'm sorry, he said. She rubbed her face and heaved the lever until more water poured over her. Kale went on. I just wanted to end it for him. You were right. All this time, you were right. But I wanted it to do it myself. I didn't know it would... I'm sorry. She released the lever and pivoted to look up at him. I saved my enemy's life today, she said flatly. She uncoiled to her feet, wiping the water from her face. And though he stood taller than her, he felt smaller as Aelin stared at him. No. Not just Aelin. Queen Aelin Ash River Galathinius, he realized, was staring at him. They tried to shoot my... Rowan through the heart. And I saved her anyway. <clears throat> I know, he said. Her scream when that arrow had gone through Rowan. I'm sorry, he said again. She gazed up at the stars, toward the north. Her face was so cold. Would you truly have killed him if you'd had the chance? Yes, Kaol breathed. I was ready for that. She slowly turned to him. We'll do it together. We'll free magic, and then you and I will go in there and end it together. You're not going to insist I stay back? How can I deny you that last gift to him? Aelin. Her shoulders sagged lightly. I don't blame you. If it had been Rowan with that collar around his neck, I would have done the same thing. The words hit him in the gut as she walked away. A monster. He'd called her weeks ago. He had believed it, and allowed it to be a shield against the bitter tang of disappointment and sorrow. He was a fool. They moved Rowan before dawn. By whatever immortal grace lingering in his veins, he healed enough to walk on his own. 
and so they slipped out of the lovely country house before any of the staff awoke. Aelin said goodbye, only to Fleetfoot, who had slept curled by her side during the long night that she'd watched over Rowan. Then they were off, Aelin and Adian flanking Rowan, his arms slung over their shoulders as they hurried across the foothills. The early morning mist coated them as they made their way into Rifthold one last time. And that was chapter 61. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think we are going to be reading until I run out of water, which is probably maybe like two more chapters. We'll see. Chapter 62 Manon didn't bother looking pleasant as she sent the Braxos slamming into the ground in front of the king's party. The horses whinnied and bucked while the thirteen circled above the clearing in which they'd spotted the party. Wing leader, the king said from astride his war horse, not at all perturbed. Beside him, his son, Dorian, cringed. Cringed the way that blonde thing had in Morath had when it attacked them. Was there something you wanted? The king asked coolly. Or a reason you look halfway to Hellas's realm? Manon dismounted Abraxos and walked toward the king and his son. The prince focused on his saddle, careful not to meet her eyes. There are rebels in your woods, she said. They took your little prisoner out of the wagon and then tried to attack me and my thirteen. I slaughtered them all. I hope you don't mind. They left three of your men dead in the wagon. So it seems their loss wasn't noticed. The king merely said, You came all this way to tell me that? I came all this way to tell you that when I face your rebels, your enemies, I shall have no interest in prisoners, and the Thirteen are not a caravan to transport them as you will. She stepped closer to the prince's horse. Dorian, she said, a command and a challenge. Sapphire eyes snapped to hers, no trace of otherworldly darkness. Just a man trapped inside. She faced the king. You should send your son to Morath. It'd be his sort of place. Before the king could reply, Manon walked back to Abraxos. She'd planned on telling the king about Aelin, about the rebels who called themselves Adian and Rowan and Kaol. But they were human and could not travel swiftly, not if they were injured. She owed her enemy a life debt. Manon climbed into Abraxos' saddle. My grandmother might be high witch, she said to the king, but I ride at the head of the armies. The king chuckled. Ruthless, I think I rather like you, ringleader. That weapon my grandmother made, the mirrors, you truly plan to use shadow fire with it? The king's ruddy face tightened with warning. The replica inside the wagon had been a fraction of the size of what was depicted in the plans, nailed to the wall. Giant, transportable battle towers. A hundred feet high, their insides lined with the sacred mirrors of the ancients. Mirrors that were once used to build and break and mend. Now they would be amplifiers, reflecting and multiplying any power the king chose to unleash, until it became a weapon that could be aimed at any target. If the power were Caltain's shadow fire... You ask too many questions, wing leader, the king said. I don't like surprises, was her only reply. Except this... This had been a surprise. The weapon wasn't for winning glory, or triumph, or for the love of battle. It was for extermination. A full-scale slaughter that would involve little fighting at all. Any opposing army, even Aelin and her warriors, would be defenseless. The king's face was turning purple with impatience. But Manon was already taking to the skies, Abraxos beating his wings hard. She watched the prince until he was a speck of black hair and wondered what it was like to be trapped within that body. Elid Lachan waited for the supply wagon. It didn't come. A day late. Two days late. She hardly slept for fear it would arrive when she was dozing. When she awoke on the third day, her mouth dry, it was already habit to hurry down to help in the kitchens. 
She worked until her leg nearly gave out. Then, just before sunset, the whinny of horses and the clatter of wheels and the shouts of men bouncing off the dark stones as the long stones of the long keep bridge. Elide slipped from the kitchen before they could notice her, before the cook could conscript her into performing some new task. She hurried up the steps as best she could with her chains, her heart in her throat. She should have kept her things downstairs, should have found some hiding spot. Up and up into Manon's tower. She'd refilled the water skin each morning and had amassed a little supply of food in a pouch. Elide threw open the door to Manon's room, surging for the pallet where she kept her supplies. But Vernon was inside. He sat on the edge of Manon's bed as if it were his own. Going somewhere, Elide? And that was chapter 62. <clears throat> <clears throat> On to chapter 63. Where on earth could you be headed? Vernon said as he stood, smug as a cat. Panic bleated in her veins. The wagon. The wagon. Was that the plan all along? To hide among those witches and then run? A lead back toward the door. Vernon clicked his tongue. We both know there's no point in running. And the weak leader isn't going to be here any time soon. Elid's knees wobbled. Oh, gods. But is my beautiful, clever niece human? Or which kind? Such an important question. He grabbed her by the elbow, a small knife in his hand. She could do nothing against the stinging slice in her arm, the red blood that welled. Not a witch at all, it seems. I am a black beak, Elid breathed. She would not bow to him, would not cower. Vernon circled her. Too bad they're all up north and can't verify it. Fight, 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 her blood sang. Do not let him cage you. Your mother went down fighting. She was a witch, and you are a witch, and you do not yield. You do not yield. Vernon lunged, faster than she could avoid in her chains one hand gripping her under the arm while the other slammed her head into the woods so hard that her body just stopped. That was all he needed, that stupid pause, to pin her other arm, gripping both in his hand while the other now clenched on her neck, hard enough to hurt, to make her realize that her uncle had once trained as her father had. You're coming with me. No. The word was a whisper of breath. His grip tightened twisting her arms until they barked in pain. Don't you know what a prize you are? What you might be able to do? He yanked her back, opening the door. No. No, she wouldn't let him take her. Wouldn't. But screaming would do her no good. Not in a keep full of monsters. Not in a world where no one remembered she existed or bothered to care. She stilled, and he took that as acquiescence. She could feel his smile at the back of her head as he nudged her into the stairwell. Blackbeak blood is in your veins, along with our family's generous line of magic. He hauled her down the stairs, and bile burned her throat. There was no one coming for her, because she had belonged to no one. The witches don't have magic, not like us, but you, a hybrid of both lines. Vernon gripped her arm harder, right over the cut he'd made, and she cried out. The sound echoed, hollow and small, down the stone stairwell. You do your house a great honor, Elide. Vernon left her in a freezing dungeon cell. No light, no sound save for the dripping of water somewhere. Shaking, Elide didn't even have the words to beg as Vernon tossed her inside. You brought this upon yourself, you know, he said. When you allied with that witch and confirmed my suspicions that their blood flows through your veins. He studied her. 
but she was gobbling down the details of the cell. Anything. Anything to get her out. She found nothing. I'll leave you here until you're ready. I doubt anyone will notice your absence anyway. He slammed the door. The darkness swallowed her entirely. She didn't bother trying the handle. Manon was summoned by the Duke the moment she set foot in Morath. The messenger was cowering in the archway of the airy and could barely get the words out as he took in the blood and dirt and dust that still covered Manon. She'd contemplated snapping her teeth at him just for trembling like a spineless fool. But she was drained, her head was pounding, and anything more than basic movement required far too much thought. None of the thirteen had dared say anything about her grandmother, that she had approved of the breeding. Sorrel and Vesta trailing mere steps behind her, Manon flung open the doors to the Duke's council chamber, letting the slamming wood say enough about what she thought of being summoned immediately. The Duke, only Caltaine beside him, flicked his eyes over her. Explain your appearance. Manon opened her mouth. If Vernon heard that Aelin Galathinius was alive, if he suspected for one heartbeat that the debt that Aelin might feel toward a lead's mother for saving her life, he might very well decide to end his niece's life. Rebels attacked us. I killed them all. The Duke chuckled, chucked a file of papers onto the table. They hit the glass and slid, spreading out in a fan. For months now, you've wanted explanations. Well, here they are. Status reports on our enemies, larger targets for us to strike. His Majesty sends his best wishes. Manon approached. Did he also send that demon prince into my barracks to attack us? She stared at the Duke's thick neck, wondering how easily the rough skin would tear. Parrington's mouth twisted to the side. Roland had outlived his usefulness. Who better to take care of him than your thirteen? I hadn't realized we were to be your executioners. She should indeed rip out his throat for what he'd tried to do. Beside him, Caltain was wholly blank. A shell. But that shadow fire. Would she summon it if the duke were attacked? Sit and read the files, wing leader. She didn't appreciate the command and let out a snarl to tell him so. But she sat and read. Reports on Eelway, on Melisande, on Fenharrow, on the Red Desert, and Wendland. And on Terrason. According to the report, Aelin Galathinius, long believed to be dead, had appeared in Wendelin and bested four of the Vog princes, including a lethal general in the king's army, using fire. Aelin had fire magic, Alid had said. She could have survived the cold. But, but that meant that magic... Magic still worked in Wendelin, and not here. Manon would, be a, would bet a great deal of the gold hoarded at Blackbeak Keep that the man in front of her, and the king in Rifthold, was the reason why. Then a report of Prince Adian Ashriver, former general of Adderlin, kin to the Ashrivers of Wendelin, being arrested for treason, for associating with rebels. He had been rescued from his execution mere weeks ago by unknown forces. Possible suspects, Lord Wren Allsbrook of Terrason, and Lord Kaol Westfall of Adderlin, who had loyally served the king as his captain of the guard until he joined forces with Adian this past spring and fled the castle the day of Adian's capture. They suspected the captain hadn't gone far and that he would try to free his lifelong friend, the crown prince. Free him. The prince had taunted her, provoked her, as if trying to get her to kill him, and Roland had begged for death. If Kael and Aiden were both now with Aelin Galathinius, all working together, they hadn't been in the forest to spy, but to save the prince, and whoever that female prisoner had been. They'd rescued one friend, at least. The duke and the king didn't know. They didn't know how close they'd been to all their targets, or how close their enemies had come to seizing their prince. That was why the captain had come running. He had come to kill the prince, the only mercy he believed he could offer him. The rebels didn't know what, that the man was still inside. Well, the duke demanded, any questions? You have yet to explain the necessity of the weapon my grandmother is building. A tool like that could be catastrophic. If there's no magic, then surely obliterating the Queen of Terrison can't be worth the risk of using those towers. 
Better to be overprepared than surprised. We have full control of the towers. Manon tapped an iron nail on the glass table. This is a base of information, wing leader. Continue to prove yourself, and you will receive more. Prove herself? She hadn't done anything lately to prove herself, except... Except shred one of his demon princes and butcher that mountain tribe for no good reason. A shiver of rage went through her. Unleashing the prince and the barracks hadn't been a message then, but a test. To see if she could hold up against his worst, and still obey. Have you picked a coven for me? Manon forced herself to give a dismissive shrug. I was waiting to see who behaved themselves the best while I was away. It'll be their reward. You have until tomorrow. Manon stared him down. The moment I leave this room, I'm going to bathe and sleep for a day. If you or your little demon cronies bother me before then, you'll learn just how much I enjoy playing executioner. The day after that, I'll make my decision. You wouldn't be avoiding it, would you? Wing leader. Why should I bother handing out favors to covens that don't deserve them? Manon didn't give herself one heartbeat to contemplate what the matron was letting these men do as she gathered up the files, shoved them into Sorrel's arms, and strode out. She had just reached the stairs to her tower when she spotted Asterin leaning against the archway, picking at her iron nails. Sorrel and Vesta sucked in their breath. What is it? Manon demanded, flicking out her own nails. Asterin's face was a mask of immortal boredom. We need to talk. She and Astrin flew into the mountains, and she let her cousin lead. Let Abraxos follow Astrin's sky-blue female until they were far from Morath. They alighted on a little plateau covered in purple and orange wildflowers. Its grasses hissing in the wind. Abraxos was practically grunting with joy. And Manon, her exhaustion as heavy as the red cloak she wore, didn't bother to reprimand him. They left their wyverns in the field. The mountain wind was surprisingly warm. The day clear, and the sky full of fat, puffy clouds. She'd ordered Sorrel and Vesta to remain behind, despite their protests. If things had gotten to the point where Astrin could not be trusted to be alone with her, Manon didn't want to consider it. Perhaps that was why she had agreed to come. Perhaps it was because of the scream Astrin had issued from the other side of the ravine. It had been so like the scream of the blue-blood heir, Petra, when her wyvern had been ripped to shreds. Like the scream of Petra's mother when Petra and her wyvern, Keeley, had tumbled into thin air. Astrin walked to the edge of the plateau, the wild flowers swaying about her calves, her riding leathers shining in the bright sun. She unbraided her hair, shaking out the golden waves then unbuckled her sword and daggers and let them thud to the ground. I need you to listen and not talk, she said as Manon came to stand beside her. A high demand to make of her heir, but there was no challenge, no threat in it, and Astrin had never spoken to her like that, so Manon nodded. Astrin stared out across the mountains, so vibrant here, now that they were far from the darkness of Morath. A balmy breeze flitted between them, ruffling Astrin's curls until they looked like sunshine given form. When I was twenty-eight, I was off hunting krakens in a valley just west of the Fangs. I had a hundred miles to go before the next village, and when a storm rolled in, I didn't feel like landing. So I tried to outrace the storm on my broom, tried to fly over it, but the storm went on and on, up and up. I don't know if it was the lightning or the wind, but suddenly I was falling. I managed to get control of my broom long enough to land, but the impact was brutal. Before I blacked out, I knew my arm was broken in two different places. My ankle twisted beyond use, and my broom shattered. Over 80 years ago. This had been over 80 years ago, and Manon had never heard of it. She'd been off on her own mission, where she couldn't remember now. All those years she'd spent hunting krakens had blurred together. When I awoke, I was in a human cabin, my broom in pieces beside the bed. The man who had found me said he'd been riding home through the storm and saw me fall from the sky. He was a young hunter, mostly of exotic game, which is why he had a cabin out in the deep wild. I think I would have killed him if I'd had, my, if I'd had any strength, if only because I wanted his resources. 
but I faded in and out of consciousness for a few days while my bones knitted together. And when I awoke again, he fed me enough that he stopped looking like food or a threat. A long silence. I stayed there for five months. I didn't hunt a single kraken. I helped him stock game, found iron wood, and began carving a new broom. And, and we both knew what I was, what he was, that I was long-lived and he was human. But we were the same age at that moment, and we didn't care. So I stayed with him until my orders bade me report back to Blackbeak Keep, and I told him. I said I'd come back when I could. Manon could hardly think, hardly breathe over the silence in her head. She'd never heard of this, not a whisper, for Astrin to have ignored her sacred duties, for her to have taken up with this human man. I was a month pregnant when I arrived at Blackbeak Keep. Manon's knees wobbled. You were already gone, off on your next mission. I told no one, not until I knew that the pregnancy would actually survive those first few months. Not unexpected, as most witches lost their offspring during that time. For the witchling to go past that, grow past that threshold was a miracle in itself. But I made it to three months, then four, and when I couldn't hide it anymore, I told your grandmother. She was pleased and ordered me on the bed, on bed rest in the keep. So nothing disturbed me or the witchling in my belly, in my womb. I told her I wanted to go back out, but she refused. I knew better than to tell her I wanted to return to that cabin in the forest. I knew she'd kill him. So I remained in the tower for months, a pampered prisoner. You even visited, twice. But she didn't tell you I was there. Not until the witchling was born, she said. A long, uneven breath. It wasn't uncommon for witches to be overprotective of those carrying witchlings, and Asterin, bearing the matron's bloodline, would have been a valued commodity. I made a plan. The moment I recovered from the birth, the moment they looked away, I'd take the witchling to her father and present her to him. I thought maybe a life in the forest, quiet and peaceful, would be better for my witchling than the bloodshed we had. I thought maybe it would be better for me. Astrin's voice broke on the last two words. Manon couldn't bring herself to look at her cousin. I gave birth. The witchling almost ripped me in two coming out. I thought it was because she was a fighter, because she was a true black beak, and I was proud. Even as I was screaming, even as I was bleeding, I was so proud of her. Astrin fell silent, and Manon looked at her at last. Tears were rolling down her cousin's face, gleaming in the sunshine. Asterin closed her eyes and whispered into the wind. She was stillborn. I waited to hear that cry of triumph, but there was only silence. Silence, and then your grandmother. She opened her eyes. Your grandmother struck me. She beat me, again and again. All I wanted to do, all I wanted was to see my witchling, and she ordered them to have her burned instead. She refused to let me see her. I was a disgrace to every witch who had come before me. I was to blame for a defective witchling. I had dishonored the Blackbeaks. I had disappointed her. She screamed it at me again and again. And when I sobbed, she... She... Manon didn't know where to stare, what to do with her arms. A stillborn was a witch's greatest sorrow and shame. But for her grandmother... Asterin unbuttoned her jacket and shrugged it off into the flowers. She removed her shirt and the one beneath, until her golden skin glowed in the sunlight, her breasts full and heavy. Asterin turned and Manon fell to her knees in the grass. There, branded on Asterin's abdomen in vicious crude letters was one word. Unclean. She branded me had them heat up the iron in the same flame where my witch link burned and stamped each letter herself. She said I had no business ever trying to conceive a black beak again, that most men would take one look at the word and run. Eighty years. For eighty years she had hidden this, but Manon had seen her naked had... No. No, she hadn't. Not for decades and decades, when they were witchlings, yes, but... In my shame, I told no one. Sorrel and Vesta. Sorrel knew because she was in that room. Sorrel fought for me, begged your grandmother. Your grandmother snapped her arm and sent her out. 
But after the matron chucked me into the snow and told me to crawl somewhere and die, Sorrel found me. She got Vesta, and they brought me to Vesta's airy deep in the mountains. And they secretly took care of me for the months that I, that I could not get out of bed. Then one day, I just woke up and decided to fight. I trained. I healed my body. I grew strong, stronger than I'd been before. And I stopped thinking about it. A month later, I went hunting for Krakens and walked back into the keep with three of their hearts in a box. If your grandmother was surprised I hadn't died, she didn't show it. You were there that night I came back. You toasted in my honor and said you were proud to have such a fine second. Still on her knees, the damp earth soaking into her palm, into her pants, Manon stared at the hideous brand. I never went back to the hunter. I didn't know how to explain the brand, how to explain your grandmother, or apologize. I was afraid he'd treat me as your grandmother had, so I never went back. Her mouth wobbled. I fly overhead every few years, just, just to see. She wiped at her face. He never married, and even when he was an old man, I'd sometimes see him sitting on that front porch, as if he were waiting for someone. Something. Something was cracking and aching in Manon's chest, caving in on itself. Astrin sat among the flowers and began pulling on her clothes. She was weeping silently, but Manon didn't know if she should reach out. She didn't know how to comfort, how to soothe. I stopped caring, Astrin said at last, about anything and everything. After that, it was all a joke and a thrill, and nothing scared me. That wildness, that untamed fierceness. They weren't born of a free heart, but of one that had known despair so complete that living brightly, living violently, was the only way to outrun it. But I told myself, Esther and finished buttoning her jacket. I would dedicate my, my life wholly to being your second, to serving you, not your grandmother, because I knew your grandmother had hidden me from you for a reason. I think she knew you would have fought for me. And whatever your grandmother saw in you that made her afraid, it was worth waiting for, worth serving. So I have. The day Abraxos had made the crossing, when her 13 had looked ready to fight their way out, should her grandmother give the order to kill her. Astrin met her stare. Sorrel, Vesta, and I have known for a very long time what your grandmother is capable of. We never said anything because we feared that if you knew, it could jeopardize you. The day you saved Petra instead of letting her fail, instead of letting her fall. You weren't the only one who understood why your grandmother made you slaughter that Kraken. Astrin shook her head. I am begging you, Manon. Do not let your grandmother and these men take our witches and use them like this. Do not let them turn our witchlings into monsters. What they've already done. I'm begging you to help me undo it. Manon swallowed hard, her throat achingly tight. If we defy them, they will come after us, and they will kill us. I know. We all know. That's what we wanted to tell you the other night. Manon looked at her cousin's shirt, as if she could see through to the brand beneath. That is why you've been behaving this way? I am not foolish enough to pretend that I don't have a weak spot where witchlings are concerned. This was why her grandmother had pushed for decades to have Asterin demoted. I don't think it's a weak spot, Manon admitted, and glanced over her shoulder to where Abraxos was sniffing at the wildflowers. You're to be reinstated as second. Esther and bowed her head. I am sorry, Manon. You have nothing to be sorry for, she dared to add. Are there others who my grandmother treated this way? Not in the Thirteen, but in other covens. Most let themselves die when your grandmother cast them out. And Manon had never been told. She had been lied to. Manon gazed westward across the mountains. Hope, Alid had said. Hope for a better future. For a home. Not obedience, brutality, discipline. But hope. We need to proceed carefully. Astorin blinked, the gold flecks in her black eyes glittering. What are you planning? Something very stupid, I think. And that was chapter 63. 
Let me see how long the next chapter is. Not too long. We can do one more chapter. And then I think we will probably call it there. <sighs> chapter 64. Rowan barely remembered anything of the agonizing trip back to Rifthold. By the time they had snuck across the city walls and through the alleys to reach the warehouse, he was so exhausted that he'd hardly hit the mattress before unconsciousness dragged him under. He awoke that night, or was it the next, with Aelin and Adian sitting on the side of the bed, talking. Solstice is in six days. We need to have everything lined up by then, she was saying to her cousin. So you're going to ask Ress and Brollo to just leave a back door open so you can sneak in? Don't be so simple-minded. I'm going to walk in through the front door. Of course she was. Rowan let out a groan, his tongue dry and heavy in his mouth. She whirled to him, half lunging across the bed. How are you feeling? She brushed a hand over his forehead, testing for fever. You seem all right. Fine, he grunted. His arm and shoulder ached. But he'd endured worse. The blood loss had been what knocked his feet out from under him. More blood than he'd ever lost at once, at least so quickly, thanks to his magic being stifled. He ran an eye over Aelin. Her face was drawn and pale, a bruise kissed her cheekbone, and four scratches marred her neck. He was going to slaughter that witch. He said as much, and Aelin smiled. If you're in the mood for violence, then I suppose you're just fine. But the words were thick, and her eyes gleamed. He reached out with his good arm to grip one of her hands and squeeze tightly. Please don't ever do that again, she breathed. Next time, I'll ask them not to fire arrows at you. Or me. Her mouth tightened and wobbled, and she rested her brow on his good arm. He lifted the other arm, sending burning pain shooting through him as he stroked her hair. It was still matted in a few spots with blood and dirt. She must not have bo even bothered with a full bath. Adian cleared his throat. We've been thinking up a plan for freeing magic and taking out the king and Dorian. Just tell me tomorrow, Rowan said, a headache already blooming. The mere thought of explaining to them, again, that every time he'd seen Hellfire used it had been more destructive than anyone could anticipate made him want to go back to sleep. Gods, without his magic, humans were remarkable. To be able to survive without leaning on magic, he had to give them credit. Adian yawned, the lousiest attempt at one Rowan had ever seen, and excused himself. Adian, uh, Adian, he said, and the general paused in the doorway. Thank you. Any time, brother. He walked out. Aelin was looking between them, her lips pursed. What? He said. She shook her head. You two are nice when you're wounded. It's unsettling. Seeing the tears shine in her eyes just now had nearly unsettled him. If magic had already been freed, those witches would have been ashes the moment that arrow hit him. Go take a bath, he growled. I'm not sleeping next to you while you're covered in that witch's blood. She examined her nails, still slightly lined with dirt and blue blood. Ugh, I've washed them ten times already. She rose from her seat on the side of the bed. Why? he asked. Why did you save her? She dragged a hand through her hair. A white bandage around her upper arm peeked through her shirt with the movement. He hadn't even been conscious for that wound. He stifled the urge to demand to see it, assess the injury himself, and tuck her close against him. Because that golden-haired witch, Asterin, Aelin said, she screamed Manon's name the way I screamed yours. Rowan stilled. His queen gazed at the floor, as if recalling the moment. How can I take away somebody who means the world to someone else? Even if she's my enemy. A little shrug. I thought you were dying. It seemed like bad luck to let her die out of spite, and... She snorted. Falling into a ravine seemed like a pretty shitty way to die for someone who fights that spectacularly. Rowan smiled, drinking in the sight of her. The pale, grave face. The dirty clothes. 
the injuries. Yet her shoulders were back, chin high. You make me proud to serve you. A jaunty slant to her lips, but silver lined her eyes. I know. You look like shit, Lysandra said to Aelin. Then she remembered Evangeline, who stared at her wide eyes and winced. Sorry. Evangeline refolded her napkin in her lap, every inch the dainty little queen. You said I'm not allowed to use such language, and yet you do. I can curse, Lysandra said as Aelin suppressed a smile, because I'm older and I know when it's most effective, and right now our friend looks like absolute shit. Evangeline lifted her eyes to Aelin, her red-gold hair bright in the morning sun through the kitchen window. You look even worse in the morning, Lysandra. Aelin choked out a laugh. Careful, Lysandra. You've got a hellion on your hands. Lysandra gave her young ward a long look. If you've finished eating the tarts, clean off our plates, Evangeline. Go onto the roof and raise hell for Adian and Rowan. Take care with Rowan, Aelin said. Aelin added. He's still on the mend, but pretend that he isn't. Men get pissy if you fuss. A wicked gleam in her eye, Evangeline bounded for the front door. Aelin listened to make sure the girl did indeed go upstairs and then tour turned to her friend. She's going to be a handful when she's older. Lysandra groaned. You think I don't know that? Eleven years old and she's already a tyrant. It's an endless stream of why and I would prefer not to and why, why, why and... No. I should not like to listen to your good advice, Lysandra. She rubbed her temples. A tyrant, but a brave one, Aelin said. I don't think there are many 11-year-olds who would do what she did to save you. The swelling had gone down, but the bruises still marked Lysandra's face, and the small scab cut near her lip remained an angry red. And I don't think there are many 19-year-olds who would fight tooth and nail to save a child. Lysandra stared down at the table. I'm sorry. Aelin said. Even though Arabin orchestrated it, I'm sorry. You came for me, Lysandra said so quietly that it was hardly a breath. All of you, you came for me. She had told Nesrin and Kael in detail of her overnight stay in a hidden dungeon beneath the city streets. Already, the rebels were combing the sewers for it. She remembered little of the rest, having been blindfolded and gagged. Wondering if they would put a wordstone ring on her finger had been the worst of it, she said. That dread would haunt her for a while. You thought we wouldn't come for you? I've never had friends who cared what happened to me, other than Sam and Wesley. Most people would have let me be taken, dismissed me as just another whore. I've been thinking about that. Oh? Aelin reached into her pocket and pushed a folded piece of paper across the table. It's for you. And her. We don't need... Lysandra's eyes fell upon the wax seal. A snake in midnight ink. Clarissa sigil. What is this? Open it. Glancing between her and the paper, Lysandra cracked the seal and read the text. I, Clarice Duvency, hereby declare that any debts owed to me by... The paper began shaking. Any debts owed to me by Lysandra and Evangeline are now paid in full. At their earliest convenience, they may receive the mark of their freedom. The paper fluttered to the table as Lysandra's hand slackened. She raised her head to look at Aelin. Ugh, Aelin said, even as her own eyes filled. I hate you for being so beautiful, even when you cry. Do you know how much money? Did you think I'd leave you enslaved to her? I don't... I don't know what to say to you. I don't know how to thank you. You don't need to. Lysandra put her face in her hands and sobbed. I'm sorry if you wanted to do the proud and noble thing and stick it out for another decade, Aelin began. <clears throat> Lysandra only wept harder. But you have to understand that there was no running way I was going to leave without... Shut up, Aelin, Lysandra said through her hands. Just shut up. She lowered her hands, her face now puffy and splotchy. Aelin sighed. Oh, thank the gods. You can look hideous when you cry. Lysandra burst out laughing. Manon and Asterin stayed in the mountains all day and night after her second revealed her invisible wound. 
They caught mountain goats for themselves and their wyverns and roasted them over a fire that night as they carefully considered what they might do. When Manan eventually dozed off, curled against a Braxos with a blanket of stars overhead, her head felt clearer than it had in months. And yet something nagged at her, even in sleep. She knew what it was when she awoke, a loose thread in the loom of the three-faced goddess. You ready? asked her and said, mounting her pale blue wyvern and smiling. A real smile. Mana had never seen that smile. She wondered how many people had. Wondered if she herself had ever smiled that way. Manan grazed northward. There's something I need to do. When she explained it to her second, Astrin didn't hesitate to declare that she would go with her. So they stopped by Morath long enough to get supplies. They let Sorrel and Vesta know the bare details and instructed them to tell the Duke she'd been called away. They were airborne within an hour, flying hard and fast above the clouds to keep hidden. Mile after mile they flew. Manan couldn't tell why that thread kept yanking, why it felt so urgent. But she pushed them hard, all the way to Rifthold. Four days. Elite had been in this freezing, festering dungeon for four days. It was so cold that she could hardly sleep, and the food they chucked in was barely edible. Fear kept her alert, prompting her to test the door, to watch the guards whenever they opened it, to study the halls behind them. She learned nothing useful. Four days and Manon had not come for her. None of the Blackbeaks had. She didn't know why she expected it. Manon had forced her to spy on that chamber, after all. She tried not to think about what magic, what might await her. Tried and failed. She wondered if anyone would even remember her name when she was dead, if it would ever be carved anywhere. She knew the answer, and knew there was no one coming for her. And that was chapter 64, and where we are going to call it for tonight.